Yeah, we're going to keep the same order. So the next session is the one that was supposed to be after lunch. And you'll forgive me if we start counting one, two, three, zero. We're going to step backwards now. We're going to kind of deconstruct host microbe interactions and look at different ways that we can isolate, in particular if you're looking at a quote unquote bad bug, a pathogen in your classic sense, a normal indigenous microbiota in the host, we're going to look at different ways of kind of taking these apart and looking at the different interactions that you can have. Our first speaker today uh, is Rob Britton, and Rob is going to talk about some interesting ways that we can look at the microbiota in a way kind of removing it from the host and yet still have it behave as a consortium, as a community, and what can we learn from that that would actually uh, tell us about host microbe interactions. So once he figures out how to put that on. All right. We're good? Okay. Uh, did I turn it on? Is this, uh, is this on? Yeah. Good? Okay. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation, uh, and it's been a very interesting workshop so far. Uh, this is advanced. Okay, great. Um, so my lab moved down to Baylor College of Medicine a couple of years ago, and uh, here's uh, uh, the medical center here. That's downtown. Uh, you can see it pretty much looks like its own downtown. Um, glad uh, uh, this time of year, I'm really glad I live there. Uh, don't ask me in July. Uh, it's uh, not quite so pleasant. But what got me down there was the Center for Metagenomics and Microbiome Research. Buck Samuel talked earlier today. We uh, have a really nice group of people that are really focused on a number of different areas of host uh, microbiome interactions. Um, and so my laboratory uh, is really hyper-focused on therapeutic microbiology. So our main goal uh, over the next uh, 20 years, hopefully, is to uh, get something like Patrice has going, uh, actually get some of these bugs into people and, and start uh, uh, curing lots of different diseases. Um, one uh, project that, um, go back there. Um, actually, I'll note here is this probiotics and bone health. Uh, these workshops, I think, are really great for learning about new areas that you're not familiar with. And so I saw Skip talk last year at one of these at NIH. Uh, and it turns out that when my colleagues here at Michigan State um, essentially uh, cleaned up their mouse room, they lost a phenotype. And after I saw Skip, I said, hey, I think maybe we should go get a virus and put it back in. So we actually got this virus from Skip's lab. Uh, we don't have the data yet, but we're doing an experiment right now. So uh, in any event, uh, we care about viruses now. <laughs> so, um, so what I wanted to do today, so my, I was invited to actually talk to you uh, really about an in vitro system and really how do you study complex uh, microbial communities um, at the, both the structure and also the functional level, because that's really what we care about. You know, how do we actually start assaying the functions of these communities? Um, and so I'll tell you about uh, these mini bioreactor arrays that we've uh, developed. Um, I'll, I'll highlight just briefly the uh, role of Clostridium difficile uh, in invading these microbial communities and how we were able to use this tool. Uh, and then I'll just go ahead and uh, tell you about some of the future directions we have and some of the challenges I think that uh, are, are, are uh, going to be upon us. So really this uh, project started about six years ago. Uh, simple question, we just wanted to know how do micro microbial communities uh, impart resistance to pathogen invasion? Um, and essentially, uh, this was uh, done by two uh, really talented uh, people, uh, Kathy Robinson, who uh, has since graduated and actually works in Karen's lab now, uh, and uh, Jennifer Octung, who was a postdoc at the time but is now an assistant professor at Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, really what we were interested in doing is trying to develop a more high-throughput way to study how Clostridium difficile interacted with the host uh, microbiota. Um, and uh, as I'll tell you in a minute, there really wasn't a good way to do it at the time. And so we developed these mini bioreactor arrays that I'll describe to you that are really uh, relatively simple, uh, but they're really higher throughput. So we were, wanted to be able to study many different uh, interventions that we could use to see how Clostridium difficile invades the community. Uh, and it also reduces the number of animals that we've needed for experiments, because really the mouse has become sort of the go-to animal model for C. difficile, but uh, it's cumbersome, uh, and because of the different microbiotas that people have in their laboratories, different antibiotics have different impacts on the models. So we uh, really have turned to the in vitro system to, to study it. So uh, there are a number of in vitro gut models that have been highlighted in the past. Uh, this one that's shown here is probably the most used by uh, groups, Oops. and um, so this is basically a three-vessel model. Uh, you can see that it's got these huge uh, media sources. You've got three different chambers that are the ascending, uh, transverse, and descending colon. Lots of bells and whistles here. Uh, this has actually been used to study C. difficile invasion by uh, Mark Wilcox's group. Uh, the problem is, is that these take about 60 to 90 days to do a single experiment. 
Uh, and most of their experiments they publish really only have an N of one or two because it's just really a challenging model. And if you were going to use this to investigate new therapeutic drugs or perhaps probiotics in this uh, realm, you, you can see that that's just not possible to do. Uh, there's a few other um, models that are out there. This is Shime. Uh, this is also another popular one. Uh, this basically has five chambers, a stomach, uh, your duodenum, uh, your lower small intestine. Neither one of these uh, vessels actually have any bacteria in them. They only have bacteria uh, in the other three um, parts of the colon. Uh, uh, Emma Allen Burko and uh, Elaine Petroff have uh, this, what they call the RoboGut. Um, and, uh, you know, this has actually been used to uh, produce defined communities to treat a, a few people for a recurrent C. difficile infection. But the challenge of this is that this setup right there is $300,000. So um, if you wanted to make that high throughput, um, you'd, I don't know what funding source to write to for that. So, um, so we uh, decided to miniaturize it. So we, we uh, invented these guys. So these are these mini bioreactor arrays. Essentially, this is just a plastic that um, you can order from a company. Uh, they will do anything you want to it. Um, you can get uh, four of these little blocks for $900, so they're not really that expensive. You can autoclave them. Uh, they're reusable. Uh, and because they're so small, what we do is we run them right in the anaerobic chamber. So they're run in chambers that are heated to 37 degrees. Um, we got rid of uh, the, the need for dynamic pH uh, monitoring by a buffering system. Uh, we have a continuously stirred system, so there's a little, a little itty bitty stir bar in there that, that keeps things from getting too uh, clogged up at the bottom. And you can run these at different retention times um, using peristaltic pumps, which actually turns out to be one of the more expensive parts of this. So this just shows you in practice what they look like. So here's the media bottles. Um, here are our two peristaltic pumps. We're basically pumping media in and we're also pulling out. And then this comes into a, a waste area. And then each of these little reactors can uh, be an experiment. And at this time, we were set up, you can run 96 of these at a, at a, at a time. So, of course, but we designed these, uh, and I have to say, we, we actually got funded for this before we'd ever even built a reactor, which was probably the only time I will ever get an NIH grant without preliminary data. But, uh, um, but uh, we wanted to just know how did these things react? Where were we going to get a complex community? Was it going to be simplified? Um, how is it going to look compared to what the input was? So we did a study, and so this is all published in Microbiome here um, last year, if you want to get the details. We basically took three different fecal donors, uh, and we pulled them as well. Uh, and then we cultivated these in triplicate reactors uh, per donor. Um, and then we just monitored community composition daily uh, and, uh, by sequencing. So uh, nicely what we did see is that it did matter uh, who the donor was, so we didn't actually see everything just become one big clump. You can see donor A, donor B, and donor C all had distinct communities. That was over time, and it also uh, held, um, you know, over uh, replicate reactors. Uh, you can see when we pulled the data, if I don't go forward, um, that uh, the, the, the pulled uh, samples actually all clustered together. They looked more like a hybrid of A and B with C contributing less. But, but again, it did, did show that we were able to get distinct communities that, that really at least mimicked a little bit of what, what went in. Um, and so we also wanted to know what we always get asked is how quickly do these things stabilize, quote unquote. Um, and uh, the answer for us, these things get pretty stable uh, within, you know, maybe three to seven days, depending on what metric you use. And so this is just looking at an average uh, similarity of the communities, uh, zero being the most dissimilar, one being the most similar. And you can see that rapidly within three or four days, we kind of reach this steady state where uh, the reactors are fairly similar. You'll notice that they don't go up really high so that every reactor looks exactly the same, including in the replicate reactors uh, from the same. And that's usually, or that's thought to be because there's some randomness to how the community actually gets started when it comes out of either frozen or fresh fecal samples. Um, this is just another way to, to look at that. So you can see days two through seven, if you look at the similarity, you can see that, and this is comparing each day uh, to this first day, you can see that uh, from day one to day five, you actually have some dissimilarity, but by, by the time you get to day eight, uh, the difference between those five days is actually pretty stabilized. And so, um, so in any event, uh, they, they get stable pretty quick. Let's see. There we go. Of course, what's in there? Uh, that's also important. So it turns out that uh, if you look at, uh, this is just looking at the phylum level. We, we've, of course, looked at it much closer, much more closely than that. But... Um, 
Uh, but what you can see here, just from this graph, uh, the different phyla that are in here is day, uh, this zero number here is basically the fecal sample that went into the reactor, and then these numbers are all the three replicate reactors. So you can see that we do get a fairly diverse community, and it actually looks uh, reasonably representative of what, what went in, which is what we uh, saw from the previous analysis. Now, it is true that certain things that are abundant go away, and there are some things that are not abundant in the fecal sample that do become abundant. Um, but, uh, but suffice to say, we capture about half of the uh, species or operational taxonomic units, I really hate that word, but, uh, but half the OTUs that actually go into the uh, reactors. And that's about the same as, as the Shine model as well. Okay, so, but does this community actually do anything that you care about? Um, and that's what we wanted to answer. So uh, we basically set up an invasion model of cluster difficile. So if you get C. diff, C. diff is the most common cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Uh, and uh, so we basically were trying to model that. We, we, do, we took our fecal slurry. Uh, we start the flow after letting the bacteria grow for a day. Uh, and then we treat those uh, communities either with the antibiotic clindamycin or we mock treat it. Clindamycin has been clinically associated with C. difficile infection in the hospital. Uh, we then add C. difficile after this treatment, and then we just monitor the abundance. Uh, and so, uh, what we were able to nicely show is that if you actually look at clostridium difficile invasion of the community in these mock or untreated reactors, um, that you basically wash right out. So C. difficile cannot compete in that environment. Um, if we then look at clindamycin treated, uh, you can see that we get this really nice, stable um, uh, invasion of that community. Uh, this can go out, you know, uh, for, you know, 14 days. Uh, it just stays that way. These, uh, these communities are now making spores. They make toxins, so they do all the things that we don't want them to do in the gut. Um, you might say, though, you know, we really hope that we're not getting a million uh, spores per uh, patient in our hospitals, so uh, we wanted to see how low we could go. And what was really nice about this model is we can go down to as low as 150 uh, cells, and you can see that no matter what we add, it always goes in and it finds its niche. Um, that niche is 10 to the 6 CFU per mil. This is a very poor medium because we're trying to mimic the gut. So C. diff on its own would only get to 10 to the 7th if it wasn't even in competition. So, so this bug's doing pretty good in this, in this community. So uh, you might say, well, you just blew up the whole community. Uh, maybe there was nothing there for it to fight with. But just to remind you, these are continuous flow reactors. So as we're killing off certain bugs, other bugs are coming back. And this is just showing you that the load of the bacteria doesn't actually change in these reactors, so that they actually have the same biomass of, in their communities, whether or not they're treated with antibiotics or not. What does change, however, is the diversity. Uh, and you can see that here's the diversity of the um, untreated reactors versus the clindamycin treated. And you can see that there's a, quite a big loss of diversity, even though the biomass uh, stays the same. Um, so we have changed the communities. We've changed the function of the communities, and so now we know that these, these communities can support, uh, you know, the growth of C. difficile. Now we're actively trying to figure out how we're going to uh, use bacteria to get rid of that. Okay. So, um, but so what part of our move to Baylor College of Medicine, of course, being, I was at Michigan State before, we didn't have a research or teaching hospital on campus, and so we've been now, uh, di you know, interacting a lot more with clin clinicians down there, so we've been looking at uh, lots of different areas of these use of these reactors. So we're also we're looking at drug metabolism by the microbiota. That was just brought up by a, somebody asking a question in the last session. Uh, we've looked at the production of beneficial and detrimental uh, metabolites. In fact, trimethylamine, the one that Federico was talking about, we've uh, been able to model that in our reactors as well. Um, we're looking at ways to form defined microbial consortia from purified strains that might be used for any number of things, including preclinical pre testing models. Uh, the FDA ha definitely has a lot on their plate when it comes to learning how to deal with these biologicals that we're going to start uh, selling or, or, or uh, using to treat people. Uh, and then we need to establish microbial communities from other body sites. Uh, I think as much as we've ignored viruses, I think the rest of the, micro the bacterial microbial communities say we've ignored everything but the gut. Um, and so there hasn't been uh, nearly as much funding for that. Uh, something that has been brought up briefly, but not really, the other thing is that uh, we use these to cultivate hard to cultivate microbes, and that I think is a real challenge for this uh, field in the future because uh, you know, we can identify these things by sequencing, but if you really want to get them into a therapeutic role, you have to get them in pure culture and study them. There we go. So, so what are some of the future directions and challenges? I mean, you know, we could spend uh, all day on this, but 
Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do now is, of course, everybody says, well, this is all fun and it's nice, but you don't have any host component here. So we've been trying to work on interfacing these communities with uh, human enteroids and organoids. I won't say more about that because Vince is going to talk about that next. Um, we don't really have any spatial niches in our, M our mini bioreactor arrays. We just, you know, they're basically just uh, smooth on the inside, but, you know, people have asked, have you thought about putting mucus layers in there? You know, so there's, there, there's a lot of challenges there that we could meet. Um, we w really need to also begin to model other intestinal uh, sites. So, uh, for example, small intestinal communities. We really know nothing about the small intestine in terms of communities. Uh, and I think it's a really hard challenge to how we're uh, going to study that. We basically study feces at this point. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that I think is a big problem. Uh, just for MBRAs, we have troubles, you know, what kind of media do you use? Uh, we've, we've used a number of different ones. Uh, how do you functionally assess these communities? We had a nice readout with C. difficile, but, you know, how, how would you do this? And then uh, just to echo uh, Federico's point, um, I really think it's important for us to develop genetic tools uh, for commensals, as he, he pointed out, because without genetics, uh, I think the, the slog through the functional analysis of the human microbiome is going to be really slow. So uh, with that, I should thank uh, the people in my lab. Um, as I already pointed out, the two people who really did most of this work, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I just yeah, got in there. <laughs>